NCR Corporation is a leader in omnichannel solutions, turning everyday interactions with businesses into exceptional experiences. With its software, hardware, and portfolio of services, NCR enables nearly 700 million transactions daily across financial, retail, hospitality, travel, telecom, and technology industries. NCR solutions run the everyday transactions that make your life easier. NCR is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, with about 30,000 employees and does business in 180 countries. XSTEM, how are you all doing? This is clearly the coolest audience I will ever give a talk for. It is the smartest audience I will ever give a talk for. So I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to turn it over to you. So you all take to the mics, ask me whatever you want, and I'm going to build a talk around your questions. I'm going to build a talk around whatever you think is useful. And we'll make a, a, a bet. If I'm able to do this, it'll be completely extemporaneous. If I'm able to do this in 28 minutes, at the end, I'll get out in the audience. We'll shoot a super cool video. We're all screaming XTEM. And if I fail to do this, you all can go out and grab lunch. So are there any questions? I'm a psychiatrist, so I'm super used to silence. <laughs> any questions? Yeah. So I've heard um, about the ketogenic diet helping with epilepsy and stuff. Do you have an opinion on that? OK, yep, I'll work that in. Yep. Okay. Hi. Thoughts? I will answer all these. I'll build them into the talk. So he asked if, if questions about illnesses in kid, like aid kids, like ADHD, are those valid, or have we invented those? Great. Uh, folks at the mic, what else? What are some of the goals you set to get to psychiatry? Yes, great. All right. Um, this is more of a general question. I've heard a lot about uh, emailing people and getting your name out there. What would be a good place to find set emails and to, like, what would a valid email sound like so you don't sound like just some kid who's not serious. Um, I will answer that question. In fact, if I don't get to your question, um, pull out your cell phones, get on Twitter. I'm at Kafwidrasa, first name, last name. And if you put your question there, I'll be sure to answer it in the next two days or so. But what else do we have? You just don't get to shape the talk if you do it that way. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, what have you learned about like anxiety and genetics? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. So why are you basically doing, like, rounding it around us? Because I, like, not a lot of people do that, so. Yeah, I, I've decided very early on that you all are smarter than me. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's the kind of mindset you find to be, um, to help you get more successful in your field? Excellent. Good question. Yeah. We'll take five or six more. So when you were all right, ten more. <laughs> so when you were going, so when you're doing your job as a psychiatrist, um, how many different kinds of people do you meet? Good question. All right, let's take one over here. Yes, sir. How long have you um, done it before? Like, how long have you done it? Yep. Good question. What inspires you to keep going? Sure, great question. Wonderful questions. Do you work with kids while well, this school? Great question. What do we have here? Correlation between mental illness and mass shootings. Yep. Um, what was your like college path and This high is school? becoming a really hard like, talk to give. There are a lot of questions, but <laughs> go ahead. Your like high school and college path, like what did that look like? Okay, great. Yep. I will work that in. Okay. How are you able to develop an interest and then pursue that interest in psychology and artificial intelligence. Yeah, great question. Okay, let's get three more. How do One. new technology and medication help treat mental illnesses? Great. Um, what are your opinions on the ethics of genetic modifications? Oof, good question. Nice, nice. How exactly did you start? What was your base? Okay, all right. So, so let's do this again. Uh, if you're standing up, 
pull out your phone, tweet it to me, I'll be sure to answer. And if there's any time left at the end, after we all scream, scream uh, and yell really loudly, X STEM, uh, because I plan on winning the bet, uh, we'll, we'll take a couple more questions, all right? So I remember when I was growing up and I saw the future. For me growing up, uh, the future was always in movies. And so there's a series at this time. Uh, it was Star Wars, it was Empire Strikes Back, it was Return of the Jedi. And growing up, uh, I remember this scene. There was a, the, the, the hero in the movie was Luke Skywalker, right? This really cool guy carried around this thing called a lifesaver. And he gets into a fight with the villain in the movie, Darth Vader. Spoiler alert, turns out it's his father, believe it or not. So he gets in this fight, and the, star, the, the lifesavers are, are, are flashing around, and Luke Skywalker gets his hand cut off. And it, it fast forwards to the scene where Luke Skywalker is sitting there, and he's, all of a sudden, he's got this robotic arm that's hooked up to him. And he's moving the fingers, and you can see the robots moving, and he's moving the arm just by thinking about it and controlling it. And that, for me, was a vision of the future that transformed everything. I spent most of my early life uh, playing around with computers, right? So I grew around the PC time. And uh, much to my mother's dismay, I was really good at taking them apart, but not very good at putting them back together. <laughs> and so she would buy a computer. I'd systematically remove the pieces, right? This is what, it, when you're young, this is engineering, right? Reverse engineering. Um, and I could never get the thing to turn back on <laughs> after I took it apart. And, you know, most of my early life, when, when I was in your age, I didn't, I didn't pay much attention in school, right? I didn't consider it very useful. I couldn't pay attention longer than 15, 20 minutes at a time. Uh, these days, they'd probably diagnose that as ADHD, believe it or not. And I, I thought much more about my life in my extracurricular activities. So I ran track all the way through high school. And there were a lot of valuable lessons um, that I learned on the track, things like pushing myself and competing and getting better every day. And I found that those things generally were way more useful than the things I was learning in the classroom, right? I just couldn't absorb information that way. And as I got near the end of undergrad, uh, my mother was way more interested in me going to school uh, for the engineering side of things instead of the athletic side of things. And there was a program at the time, it was at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where I did undergrad, and the goal of the program was to increase the number of African-American men getting PhDs in the sciences. It was started in 1988. In 89, it was opened up to women. In the year that I entered, 1996, it was opened up to folks of all different races and backgrounds with the goal of getting them PhDs in the sciences. And when I applied for this program and got in, it was pretty remarkable because I had no idea what research was. So I was in a session earlier today and there were high school students talking about the research and publishing. Like, that was not me at all. So if that's not you here, it's totally okay. It'll all work itself out. Um, I found myself in this program, and after a year and a half in, I had the opportunity to do my first research experience. And I basically, about a week and a half out, I got a call from the director of the program, and she said, I have an opportunity for you. Are you interested in doing international research? Next thing you know, I had a passport, and I was on a plane. I landed at Heathrow Airport um, in England, uh, took a, a bus ride about two or three hours, and ended up in this city called Lancaster, Lancaster, England. And I was on this campus. The campus was ruled by this peacock. It's the first time in my life and the last time I've ever been scared of a bird, right? <laughs> the bird would look at you, it would follow you. If you walked in its face, it would chase you off. And the project I was working on that summer was the, the power lines are run underground, and they have this oil in there. And then there's this active chemical in the oil called dodecalbenzene. And they found that that chemical was leaking the environment, and they wanted to know what its impact was on the food chain. And so my goal that summer was to figure out how that active chemical, dodecalbenzene, impacted the immediate environment, which meant I was basically taking earthworms and pouring the oil on them and seeing what happened to them when we watched them over a couple of weeks. And lo and behold, I concluded at the end of the summer that this chemical was not very good for the earthworms. They didn't live very long after the exposure, and that it was likely entering the food chain as well. And so I got back to my undergrad campus. I was, as I mentioned, I was interested in engineering. I knew that I loved asking questions. I also knew that I didn't want to work on earthworms or uh, the environment for the rest of my life. The next summer, I found myself at Mobile Technology Company in New Jersey. 
And a mobile technology company, I was on a project uh, where they were really interested in figuring out how they make gasoline. So they take these very large compounds, they're hydrocarbon compounds, which means they mean hydrogen and carbon, and they take these large hydrocarbon compounds and break them up into smaller compounds as part of the process of refinery. And in doing this, they use catalysts, right? These are things that make chemical reactions go quicker. And the catalysts are called zeolites. So the hydrocarbon compounds diffuse into the zeolites, they break apart and they diffuse out, right? The process of breaking the large compounds is called cracking. And I was interested in how these catalysts or these rocks became deactivated or clogged over time, which is called coking. So my first major research experience in industry was cracking and coking. <laughs> and I, I, I spend most of my time behind a computer taking data and creating mathematical models of this process of which the catalyst became deactivated. And what they were really interested in doing is seeing if you could take that deactivation process and characterize what the type of catalyst were. And it was remarkable. The best part about the summer was I got paid $17 an hour, believe it or not, um, as an undergrad. And the, the tools that I came up, the company kept using going forward as well. Um, I left that summer loving how I fused in the computer science and the math and asking questions questions, um, but I also left the summer knowing that I didn't want to work on gasoline. At the time, gas was like 86 cents a gallon. Um, I wasn't very good in history, so I thought, why would gasoline ever matter to the world, right? And, and so I wanted to do something that had an impact on human health, and I discovered this area called biomedical engineering. And the idea was you could do the same sorts of processes that were built into the engineering class that I experienced, but you could apply them to the body and human health. So I started looking around and I started looking at reading and, and I came across this set of experiments um, that were being done at Duke University. And to, to orient you to them, it, the, the experiments were being led by a guy, he, he did his training in Brazil, and he was launching a field called Brain Machine Interface. What he was able to do was imagine you take a, a monkey and you teach the monkey to play a video game. So it's playing Pac-Man. It's moving the joystick around left, right, Pac-Man is moving around, the monkey's playing the video game. It's getting juice, monkeys will do anything for juice. And the monkey gets really good at this game. And then what the investigator does is he takes electrodes, these are metal wires, each the size of a very tiny piece of hair, and puts it into the monkey's motor cortex. This is the part of the brain that deals with arm movements. So now, the investigator can look at these pulses of electrical activity as the monkey's playing the video game. And then it's a math question. Can you match those pulses of electrical activity with how Pac-Man is moving around the screen? Over time, they get really good at this. So they can predict whether the arm is moving to the left or the right or forward or background based on the pulses of electrical activity. Eventually, what they do is they disconnect the joystick, and so now only the computer is controlling Pac-Man. So the monkey's thinking, the thoughts are going in the computer, and the computer is controlling Pac-Man. So the monkey is moving Pac-Man just by thinking about it. They figure out how to do this really well. Then they build a robotic arm. They build the robotic arm and hook it up to the computer. So now Pac-Man is moving, but the robotic arm is moving too. And the monkey learns over time how to control this robotic arm. So the monkey now has an entirely new arm. It can reach across the room. It can grab apples. It can feed itself using the third arm. What the monkey figures out eventually is it actually doesn't need to move its arm to control the robotic arm. It only has to think about moving its arm to control the robotic arm. So the monkey eventually trains himself to have an entirely new limb, an entirely new robotic arm. And so, is born Brain Machine Interface. I heard about this, I remembered Luke Skywalker, and I was like, this is exactly what I want to do with my life. I started preparing, I wanted to figure out what you had to do to get into a biomedical engineering program. I looked around, a bunch of them made you take med school classes for two years, so you, you had to learn about the body, you had to learn about how things interacted with the immune system, and so I started preparing to go to medical school. I started taking pre-med classes, I studied for my exams, I applied to four schools, I got into three of them, and before you knew it, I was at Duke sitting in a medical school class. Now, I um, should have done more homework, right? I, I didn't realize they made you memorize things in medical school and that that was an important part of the learning process. I had no idea until I was in medical school that you had more training after medical school, right? I just wanted to learn about how the body worked. And there's a really cool curriculum at Duke where generally you spend two years taking classes and then you start seeing patients as part of the medical school. So the program I was in, you essentially would do two years in medical school, 
a PhD then in biomedical engineering, and then you would finish medical school. Well, Duke, you do all of your basic science, your coursework in the first year, and then the second year, you're in the hospital. So in my second year, I started in the hospital. My first rotation was at the State Psychiatric Hospital. It looked like something out of a horror movie. And I walk in with my little short white coat, and I see my attending physician. This is the doctor that's in charge. And they say, we have a couple patients that we'd love you to see. Go in and interview them, right? I'd been practicing for years how to interview patients. I knew exactly how this was supposed to go. So I walk into the room, and I'm going to paint you a visual, right? Um, it was a gentleman in his 50s or 60s. And you know, you all have like little brothers and sisters. You know how in the winter they get a little bit like, they get a cold and the snot runs down their face. This guy had been leaning over shivering and so it formed like a snot crystal on the tip of his nose. He had on really thick sunglasses. You know the type you get after you get the eyes checked? And he's in the corner of the room with the blue blanket on him and he's shivering. And so I ask him, I'm like, sir, hey, you know, how are you doing? Do you have any problems? He's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing good at all. I'm not doing good at all. I'm, ha I'm having a major headache, right? I'm like, headaches I know how to do, right? Sir, like, is it on the left side or the right side? Is it sharp or is it dull, right? Is it throbbing? He marches me all the way through it. And finally, I said, sir, so like, how long have you had this headache? When did it start? And he said, well, it all started in Vietnam. And I, and I was out there, and I was running, and, and I, I, so they caught me. And they caught me, and they put my head in a vice. And, and, they, and, and, and they, they started squeezing it. And I was in so much pain. And just when I couldn't take it anymore, and I was going to pass out, they poured water on me, woke me up, and they then squeezed it some more. And then they kept squeezing it and squeezing it and squeezing it. And right before I thought I just couldn't take it anymore, they took a drill. They drilled a hole in my head. They put a chip in there to monitor my thoughts. And ever since then, I've had a headache. So I took a second to, to catch my breath, <laughs> not the answer I was expecting, and I returned to my checklist, right? So we had a checklist that we were supposed to go through. Sir, are you like hearing anything you aren't supposed to be hearing? Um, no, no. Are you seeing things you aren't supposed to be seeing? No, no, no. Um, are you having any suicidal thoughts? And for the first time in this interview that had now gone on 23 minutes, he took off his glasses, he looked at me and said, no, but I'm have, starting to have some homicidal thoughts. Exit stage left. <laughs> and so I left the room and quickly <laughs> and went back to my attending's office, and I was filled with curiosity. I wanted to know what this gentleman had, and he had schizophrenia. I wanted to know what medications were being used to treat him. I wanted to know how they worked or how they didn't work, and it turned out nobody knew what was wrong with the organ in this gentleman's head, his brain, that was leading to these symptoms. No one could tell me how the medications worked at all, and all of a sudden these fantasies, this, this future that I saw about creating robotic body parts, right, to allow people to walk again and to move their arms again, became, it changed, and it changed into this idea that perhaps we we can create a new type of technology that will treat mental illness. And those technologies would be essentially brain pacemakers, right? We, we see this idea of electricity all throughout medicine, right? If you were to go in the, the emergency room now and you're having chest pain, right, the first thing they would do is measure electricity flowing through your heart through, through a, a set of techniques or tools called an EKG, right? And in some cases, the right treatment is a pacemaker for these changes in your heart. If any of you were to pass out right now, someone might pull some defibrillator paddles out the back because electricity is medicine. Well, it turns out electricity is medicine and psychiatry as well. Some of the most effective treatments we have for mental illnesses, such as depression, are things like electroconvulsive therapy where they put electricity into the brain. And it turns out a lot of this has a basis in biology. So as you heard in the, lo the last talk, the brain is filled with over 200 billion cells, and about half of those cells are able to generate electricity. And the way they do this is they can move small ions back and forth across their surface. These are things like sodium and potassium and calcium and, and chloride ions. And by moving them back and forth across their surface, they create electrical pulses. And when these cells talk to each other, they change those electrical pulses into chemistry, right? And those chemistry are things that we call neurotransmitters. And so the brain is both electricity and chemistry. Psychiatry has largely focused on the chemistry. It's why if you ever turn on your TV, you hear about things like chemical imbalances all of the time. But it's because we don't know how to process and understand all of the electricity in the brain. If you start to focus in and, and, and try to understand a framework of that electricity, you can almost think about the electricity like um, a conductor in an orchestra, 
right? So you have a bunch of instruments, each of these brain cells, that can play their own rhythm and their own music, but if you don't have a conductor that causes them to play together, you don't get the music or the language out of the other side of it. So what we do in my group is we try to understand electricity in the brain. We try to understand who the conductor is and who each individual instrument is by sampling electrical activity from many sites in the brain simultaneously. Now we don't get up to all 100 billion cells in the brain, but you don't need that many to understand the language, right? We can understand electrical flow through your heart by having what we call a 12 lead EKG. So 12 sensors is enough to figure out if you're having a heart attack or if you're having what's called an arrhythmia, your heart is pumping too fast or too slow. So we implant electrodes, each the size of a piece of hair, into the brains of our model species, in this case, mice. And we choose mice because you can alter the genetics in mice to mirror the genetic profiles that you see in humans with illness. We can also do things to our mice, like expose them to drugs of abuse, and we can expose them to stress. And these things basically create models of what we see in the clinic in the animals. So we take all of that electrical activity out of a mouse's brain, and then our goal is to make sense of it. And we use a set of tools called machine learning. You heard about this in the last talk as well. But the idea here is can we understand or identify the patterns that signal things like liking sugar or not liking sugar, liking another mouse or not liking another mouse, wanting to sleep or not wanting to sleep, being attentive or not being attentive. And so we can extract all of that electrical information out and then find patterns in the mice's brain. And then the next challenge becomes, well, if we identify abnormal electrical rhythms, in other words, the conductor's not coordinating the music correctly, can we fix it? And so we have another set of tools in the lab where we can manipulate activity in the brain by putting electricity back in the brain. And we can either do this directly by stimulating the brain at various sites with electricity, or we can use other tools which change various types of energy into things the brain that can use, right? So there are techniques in which you can put light into the brain and that light has changed the electrical activity the same way your eye does it, right? So you see light in your eye, that light is changed into an electrical signal that your brain can process. Um, but we can also have other techniques where you can, change, you can change auditory information, you can change mechanic information. So all of these tools and techniques, we can then put energy back in the brain. So we're trying to find a brain pattern, right? A pattern that says this is illness in the brain. And then we're trying to fix that brain pattern with a goal of correcting the illnesses, first of all, the symptoms that we see in animals, and then ultimately translating this back up to what we see in people. And, and so in, in, I, I went to Duke in 2001. I spent 2001 to 2009 finishing up medical school and graduate school with an ultimate goal of creating these tools and technologies. As I was sitting in graduate school and, and after my first experiences in the hospital, first, the first thing that happened was I realized mental illness was like a real thing, right? So I grew up here in DC. I would often walk by the metro station. You can try this uh, later this evening. And you hear people talking to themselves. Sometimes they'll be laughing. I just never knew what that was, right? As soon as I started seeing and experiencing patients, I realized that mental illnesses were real. And not only are they real, they were real. I could see them in my own family members. And I realized one day that these illnesses affected one out of four American adults annually, right? And so all of a sudden, this future for me of creating robotic body parts became a future in which we were using things like brain pacemakers to treat your brother or your sister's autism or grandma or grandpa's Alzheimer's, right? The idea that we can use technology to restore restore normal function and allow people to, to function again in society. Now, in, in, in 2013, something really magical happened. The White House was considering a new science project, right? So I would often hear about from my high school teachers about the great space age when it was this idea that humans were going to go into space and we were going to walk on the moon. And the, the White House wanted to launch a new science project. And what they ultimately decided to do was launch what they called the Brain Initiative. How many of you all have heard about the Brain Initiative? So the goal here was to figure out how the human brain worked. It started off with a modest investment, about $400 million. And, in, and what the, the goal here was, was quite simple. It was to get a bunch of engineers um, and those who do theory and math and physics to really care about neuroscience, right? 
The brain is absolutely biology. It's absolutely full of cells. But it is just as much of electrical engineering and machine learning as any other area that you can think of. And they wanted to draw in people from different disciplines because people from different disciplines bring a whole new set of ideas. And so that was the launch of it in 2013. And all of a sudden, this work and this dream that I'd had, that, I, that I'd seen in the clinic when I encountered patients, was something that the entire country cared about. <laughs> it was the most amazing feeling ever. I, I spent most of my early career worried that my colleagues would never in the world understand what I was trying to do, um, worried that my patients would never ever think about interfacing their brain directly with a computer, and here the entire country had shifted into this framework. Um, one of the most remarkable experiences that I had was in 2016, as the administration was ending uh, their last term, the White House wanted to highlight all of the investments they'd made in science. And so they put together a huge science fair uh, between Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon and Pittsburgh. And they decided that the president was going to sit on a panel with four other people. And the focus of the panel was going to be medicine and brain science. And I found myself sitting next to the president of the United States for an hour talking about brain-machine interface and its power to treat mental illness. So for me, it's been an incredible ride that started off with a high school student who, to be honest with you, could have cared less about anything that I was learning in a classroom. I just wanted to fiddle around with things. I just wanted to ask questions, and I wanted to explore. And over the course of about 20 years, I found myself sitting at the, inter at the intersection of where our, our country was going. And I think there are a lot of important lessons that came out of that for me. And you know, if there are any teachers here, please excuse me. I'm talking to the little ones for a moment. <laughs> The most important lesson for me was school is really good at teaching a lot of people how to think a certain way, and it's really important. It's like if you want to play an instrument, you learn how to play on the scales. But at some point in time, you have to learn how to create, and you have to actually learn how to do something that's different than what everybody else does. In fact, the whole goal of a PhD is to do something that no one else has ever done before. And so all of the things that made high school and, and parts of college really complicated for me, which is generally learning how to do things the way that everybody else does it, it turned out to be this extreme strength once I got headlong into actually doing the science. I realized that I had to put in very little effort to think outside of the box because I was never inside the box in the first place, right? I couldn't get inside the box no matter how much I wanted to. And so it's really important how to learn how to hold on to yourself, the things that are different and the things that are unique about you because they will become an incredible incredible strength as you embark on a career of science, right? For me, I, I've never been so excited and enthused about the future of science, right? You know, where we've gone as a nation in terms of technology, think about it. You all are interacting with computers in ways that I never imagined as a kid. Everyone carries around a computer that's more powerful than the computers I saw when I was growing up. These things are called cell phones, right? You interface with them constantly. And there is a future that's not, there's a future that's not too far out there in which at some point in time, people will figure out how to take the, the middleman, which is your fingers, right? And so the challenge for you all is going to be to decide what that future looks like, right? Um, who should have this technology? Who shouldn't have this technology? When the computers start talking back directly to your brain, where are the boundaries of humanity, right? These are questions that, frankly, folks in their 50s and 60s shouldn't be wrestling with. It's you all, right? You all should be deciding what the future of humanity is and where those boundaries are. So I'm excited for you all. Um, I, I know there's a bunch of questions that I didn't get to. The ketogenic diet is an important one. Um, my wife is a child psychiatrist, so I'd be remiss if I didn't say ADHD is a real thing. But part of the goal of the brain, remember this, is to help an organism function in an environment. And sometimes the problem is the organism, other times it's the environment, right? So I, I would challenge you all to figure out exactly what those boundaries are um, and figure out how to create and live in a world that works for you. Okay, so it is exactly 28 minutes, right? I pulled it off. So are we gonna do this like selfie, XDEM video, clapping, cheering thing? Are we gonna do it? All right, let me get my cell phone out. <laughs> or are we gonna grab lunch, right? Video? All right, so we're all gonna scream on three. We're all gonna scream x -Dem. One, two, three. x -Dem! 
So cheers to the future of American science. You all hold all of it in your hands. Thank you.